Hello everyone and welcome to a little mind sharing video of mine. Um, since since it's a rather slow night and um, a lot of time for a lot of a time for a lot of us uh, with uh, a lot of time on our hands, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, energy storage. So. Um, recently my news aggregator, uh, the I think it's the default Google News aggre aggre aggregator, um, presented me with uh, some exciting news about energy storage. And um, because it's uh, at the moment the only reliable way to uh, still produce energy or deliver energy, electric, electrical energy to the grid, uh, when the sun isn't shining, or the wind isn't blowing, or there's not enough water in our reservoirs to produce uh, hydropower. And um, two, um, yeah, I think it's um, roughly two, two um, principles that are coming up all the time. That's um, the thing I heard first about was the cryogenic energy storage. Uh, you see the article uh, at the moment uh, on your screen. It's a Wikipedia article. Um, it's It seems like this type of energy storage is pretty old. It's well researched. and um, But it's only now coming into the focus of the public eye because it wasn't feasible until now because um, we uh, un uh, until this point we always produce our energy uh, at least our elect electrical energy and I think also our thermal energy for uh, for heating our homes um, through um, coal oil and in general energy sources that were uh, always available and could be switched off with a um, let's say with a with a um, with a trigger but um, if you see one of those giant coal plants that are um, at least a hundred meters high or or something like that uh, they take quite a while uh, some of them take even over an hour to start producing energy again, but that's beside the matter. Um, yeah, as I already said, sh sun isn't shining, wind isn't blowing always, and that's a valid critique point of um, renewa renewable energy resource critiques. So um, we have to come up with a solution and cryogenic energy storage is one of it. Um, but I want to highlight some problems with it. Um, two, uh, one major problem is um, it's not very efficient. We have to be clear about that. Um, the efficiency is in the, yeah, I think it's 20 or 30 percent. Uh, I think down there is the efficiency isolation process is only 25% efficient. Uh, could be increased with other uh, energy, low grade cold store, gravel bed. So what it essentially says, we can store energy to quite the amount um, with easy hardware. Um, of course, you could use a giant battery like the um, Tesla energy storage that was built in Australia, I think half a year ago, to mitigate um, problems with the energy um, generate with the wind energy uh, generation uh, in Australia, and uh, and often enough the coal plants couldn't switch on fast enough to um, mitigate lows in the uh, in the wind. Uh, store in the wind energy generation and the um, <clears throat> usage um, of that energy. Um, this can act within milliseconds 
um, but uh, to maintain it for a large, uh, longer time, um, this is not feasible because simply uh, lithium iron or lithium polymer batteries are too expensive. I mean, you can buy them, but um, you need to replace them every once in a while. They hold quite a, uh, they hold quite for some time. They may hold a few years, but um, the lithium iron batteries are also expensive and very uh, hmm, nature unfriendly to produce. Um, li um, uh, mining lithium is okay if you do it right, but the uh, the other stuff that are used for the anodes, I think, um, are cobalt, and that's um, that's in itself is toxic, and um, also to mine it, it's not very uh, well nature friendly, so. Yeah, one of the problems of cryogenic energy storage is um, I don't know if you have used any air compressor or something um, because the usual air compressor is um, it doesn't cool down the um, the air it just compresses it but in this case you uh, cool down the air and uh, before you can cool down air like um, it's outside and um, not within your room for example the air outside is um, often much more humid and you couldn't uh, use that in every area uh, let's for ex let's say for example uh, at equator um, usually the air and end in the area of the equator is quite humid extremely humid sometimes up to a hundred percent relative humidity I think it is so um, you have to demoisturize or dry the air before you can liquefy, liquefy it because um, if you don't do that that um, water will form ice within your um, air cooling machine and will destroy the mechanics of it <clears throat> and I think you don't want that so that's a process that has to be executed before um, before cooling that air and another thing is um, like a uh, friend of mine um, raised the valid question why don't we use uh, cars with compressed air um, simple, simple answer is um, if you decompress air it cools down because uh, if you use the compressor before you know that the uh, the tank will heat up because um, um, if you think in terms of energy you will have a set volume of air like this here if you take this as a volume of air and it has an energy of let's say 10 so but if you compress it down, it still has the same energy in it. So the air particles moving, um, so uh, as a representation of the energy. If you compress it down, it still has the same energy, but the air molecules are bouncing much more, uh, much more frequently uh, at the walls of your energy, uh, your air storage, and. Um, that results in the heat up of your storage container so you have to cool that down and so you have to extract heat from that air and uh, if you depressurize it and power your car with that depressurized air then your engine will cool down and I don't know if you have any idea what happens to metal if it's really cold it gets brittle so you don't want your engine just because it's running for too long and um, you're not just driving the, around the block to get some cigarettes and back but you want to drive your car for several hundred kilometers 
and you don't want a sudden ding 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 uh, hearing in your engine because your because your engine broke and um you can't just use other materials of course you can um circumvent that problem with um using materials that are more durable at lower temperatures like like minus 100 degrees centigrade um but that it but that's expensive and no one will, no one will buy that and also if you have an accident and your pressurized tank in your trunk blows up um it's not just going to burn slowly like a um, normal internal combustion engine or um, or a battery in an electric car um, they are hard to extinguish yes but it's not an explosion like uh, a pressurized tank and so you see the problem with the heat so that's the same problem that uh, the guys that are building these this stuff are facing they have to dry the air before cooling it down and if you cool something down you produce heat and well it's waste heat uh, you could use that heat to power uh, uh, either the grid the um, the um, I don't know what it's called in English uh, uh, the teller heating so uh, heat uh, hot water is and transferred in in pipes directly into the homes um yeah but you could you could use that for uh, for this um or you can um in turn power a sterling engine sterling engine if you don't know what it is it's essentially a heat ex uh, exchange engine that's powered by the heat difference between two points so you have a hot point and a cold point and the higher the temperature difference between those two is um, the more power um, either the more force or the more speed your sterling engine will generate um, well that's uh, at least roughly it and then there was another article i found i think it was good news network um it's this company that wants to store um, um what's it called uh, waste electrical energy yeah it's it's just the electrical energy that's produced by uh the producers like solar cells uh, wind panels and i think that in the background is just a heating uh, a heat plant I don't know what it's called in translated um, where these are essentially just some mirrors and uh, they are focusing the sunlight uh, to the spot on this tower and that spot gets hot and you can do with that energy what you want you can heat up some salt and uh, store that salt somewhere else you can heat up some water and drive a turbine you can melt stuff down like you could melt iron aluminum or um, i think in the concrete production you could also use it because uh, using concrete uh, seems to be like one of the biggest uh, heat users there are because we lose a heck of a ton of concrete uh, in almost every building uh, or um, cement I think it's cement concrete is I think the final product uh, I, I think you know what I mean um, but they want to melt down aluminium to store that energy in the molten aluminium and then um, extract the heat by resolidifying the aluminium into well a solid form and using that heat to um, drive a sterling engine that's nice in one way but to be honest if i wanted to do that um, 
there are a lot, are a lot, a lot of dangerous machines and solutions out there. But if something goes wrong with this guy, um, liquid aluminium will leak all over the place. I mean, aluminium is not toxic and I don't think it will react with anything that will produce something something toxic. But um, yeah, you will have a very big area just covered in aluminium. Uh, I mean, you could uh, lower that container down into a hole and the molten aluminium will be contained within that hole because um, it will uh, solidify almost instantly if it touches the earth and will form some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called, the, uh, funnel, I think it's kind of, it's kind of a funnel, but, um, that principle was also discussed by, I forgot his name, I think I even have met him in person once, I think, 12, 13 years ago or something. Um, a guy that built in the desert, in the Sahara Desert, built a plant of exactly what's uh, there in the background. Um, just uh, a giant field of mirrors that are focusing sunlight in a certain spot in a tower that uh, melts down uh, a special salt it's not table salt and um, uh, sodium uh, chl chloride i think it's called in english um it's i think it's ca a kind of a fluoride salt or something that has a way lower melting point because uh, sodium flor uh, fl chloride um, melts like uh, at 800 degrees Celsius and most um, most machinery can't handle the um, the toxic nature of the sodium chloride at 80, 800 degrees it will react in some way and um, the plant will would be way too expensive and um, if you're using a different kind of salt um, that melts at say 250 degrees celsius that's way more manageable and they plan to store that molten salt in a giant con um, um, container uh, beneath ground level and then um, just put uh, water through that uh, molten salt um, and drive a ordinary turbine um or of course this requires um a lot of large amount of space it requires a lot of sunny days it requires a water source uh, all that stuff that's not everywhere um, available but uh, liquefying air is basically available everywhere it's just a problem of drying air in humid areas and um, I think you, the main point of this video is my idea was to combine those two solutions. You can um, liquefy air and store it because when, if it's liquefied, it's not high pressured um, and it doesn't require high pressure container. It's just requiring um, high um highly isolated containers and um, if you want to use the um, the energy that's stored within this liquid air you need to heat uh, heat it up again so um, you reintroduce that heat to that liquid air that you extracted while li liquefying said air and that in case evaporates that air that creates pressure and with this pressure you can drive a turbine and of course um, you have to uh, think about um, that turbine needs to handle very cold um, very cold air 
but if you heat that air um, back um, to um, manage manageable temperatures, let's say minus 20, 30 degrees or, or at least zero degrees so your metal w won't get brittle, um, then you need a lot of heat and that heat could be used by this solution or the same solution with some kind of salt storage. Um, admittedly the salt storage will require more space because I think uh, liquid, liquid salt can't contain as much energy per volume as liquefied aluminium would but it's way easier to handle I think at least so let's combine those two solutions um, we have the cryogenic air um, that, cry cry uh, that liquefied air is ice cold and to drive the turbine we have to heat it back up again um, but in this process we have um, we have a heat source that could be very hot like um, liquid liquefied aluminium is probably around 600 degrees celsius it's probably too much um, um, that's why i think the um, liquid salt would be better in this case and you have your liquefied air that's um, how many degrees celsius in the minus i have to check here again you have probably spotted it already oh yeah it's a uh, hundred uh, minus a hundred around minus 200 degrees celsius so you have um, let's say a salt that's 300 degrees in the plus and uh, liquefied air that's minus 200 degrees uh, celsius and you have a temperature difference of 500 degrees and as i explained before with um with a temperature difference in of this scale it's uh, probably in the first place hard to handle because you need materials that can handle at least in the startup time both extremely low temperatures and extremely high temperatures but you could drive a sterling engine that's that that's by, um which um, operates on exactly that principle um, because I think they just um, want to combine um, the molten al al aluminium and surrounding air just by heating up surrounding air uh, the surrounding air is about 20 degrees and the molten aluminium is about, about 600 degrees centigrade and they are using um, this um, difference um, but you could um, create a much greater difference if you used um, not also uh, the surrounding air but the liquefied air and in return you could also the created pressure from the liquefied air uh, used to drive a turbine so I think that would increase your um, efficiency much more because you can the temperature difference drives the sterling engine and the um, repressured air will drive um, uh, um, an ordinary turbine um, this requires a lot more engineering i'm very sure of it and probably it's not a safe bet and at the moment i think only energy storage solutions are implemented that are quite safe um, that's why uh, cryogenic energy storage sees a lot of um, i think also financial investment because it's it's easy it's safe and the people with the money understand the principle much more easy because explaining a sterling engine in its full detail is already it's not too complicated but it takes time and people with money not always uh, 
want to spend that time to be explained. Okay, what's a Sterling engine? I have no idea. Explain it to me. Uh, it cre creates rotation um, from temperature difference. Okay, uh, how do I create temperature difference? Uh, a lot of ways. And I think there's a pattern behind Sterling engines. Um, that's, uh, I think, hard to circumvent. Um, but I heard Sterling engines can get up to around 40% uh, efficiency. So if it's a stationary solution and it's not a solution that has to change in um, rotation speed um, all too much, then Sterling engines are always a better solution, but they have these exact two problems they um, are hard to hard to throttle and they are very heavy at least the uh, current uh, machines that are the, the developed and deployed um, in case you're wondering why we are don't we are not using sterling engines in our cars because um, then our cars wouldn't be required to use uh, only um, gasoline or only diesel or only gas um, so you could have one car that could drive on any kind of um, heat source because uh, you could even try uh, drive on coal on um, on hot water on wood on burning wood within your engine um, <coughs> which creates other problems but that beside that um, sterling engines are a great thing if you haven't heard about them but they are heavy and they are slow to throttle and you don't want to stay stand on the traffic light and um, put your pedal to the metal and maybe 10 or 20 seconds later you'll start driving because uh, they are slow to react to to um, to temperature difference changes. Um, so yeah, that's basically the idea. Um, just combining solutions, and I think uh, that solution won't be um, an only problem problem solver. I think you still have to, if you want to uh, react to um, energy usage usage changes within the grid. You still need to use good old batteries. Um, probably the best solution is taking old electric vehicle batteries because they are already available. No one wants to drive on them because they have less than 70% um, um, of their, their original energy capacity, but they are still valid um, and probably still for a few years usable um, energy storage and they can react within mil milliseconds and I think uh, it goes down to until uh, 10 or 20 milliseconds in reaction time and that's plenty enough for um, even extreme uh, changes within the grid and until you need um, the full uh, the full um, the full energy to compensate um, differences in the uh, in the grid, like um, changing from a day to night cycle, when your solar panels are producing zero energy, then um, I think um, until that moment um, you uh, can spin up the Stirling engines and the turbines. And I think the turbines will be um, the first ones to start up because I think turbines are pretty quick. So the only thing is you have to get the heat from the uh, heat storage quickly enough to the liquefied air to start evaporating it, creating pressure and then starting the, um, the turbine. And that's really the only problem um, that you have in reaction latency in this case. So um, it's not like the other solutions 
with uh, diesel generators. They have a set amount of startup time. They have a set amount of um, just pure energy output. They are they are not simple. They are, uh, and a diesel generator still has several, probably several thousand um, single pieces in that machinery, but um, they 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 are well researched and. Um, Practi practically everything is known about them and they are optimized probably um, uh, so far that we can't get really more than one or two percent efficiency out of them even if we put all our money into that research so um, having a multi-stage solution to um, renewable energy storage um, that sentence was uh, I wanted to construct was quite uh, complicated uh, and now I forgot uh, how to create it um, multi-stage or multi-component uh, energy storage because the short latency energy storage you are creating with um, uh, classical batteries that react within milliseconds the turbine of the liquefied air should start within a few seconds i guess and the sterling engine should probably be um depending on the size should probably up and running within several seconds to a few minutes um yeah, and, and until that point, um, you have to create enough energy to, um, yeah, until your batteries, batteries run out. So, yeah, that's about it. Um, I hope I could entertain you a little bit. Um, I had to talk about this because I think it's basically a great idea. I think I heard about something similar they are somewhere in here they're describing something similar um, by driving a sterling engine with the uh, temperature difference and uh, to, um, to heat up that uh, cold air you could use waste heat from other sources yes you could do that but um, the other way around you have a complete solution so um, your waste heat source might not be always available and might not always deliver that heat energy that you need right in that moment where you are turning on your uh, turbines. So having a, an all solution that's um, calibrated as a system in itself, a standalone system that needs no observation, that needs no manual input or even computational input, just um, a machine that has cold, that has warm, both driving a Stirling engine and the deep the, um, pressurizing cold air um, generating um, electricity via turbine or me mechanical energy basically um, both are always creating mechan mechanical energy and what you do with them is up to you I mean you could drive a, a, um, a corn mill or a wheat mill with it it's up to you uh, I think it was would be even uh, more efficient if you used uh, the mechan mechanical energy directly but um, yeah, just a train of thought. Of thought. Um, hope you liked it. Uh, maybe I will do, um, depending on the response um, in this video, I will do more of these um, just thought processes on uh, renewable energies because we can't stop, stop them, even if you want to. Even if you say they are not feasible, they will be feasible. They will be made feasible. There is no way around it. Because um, the other energy sources, they will run low 
eventually and most of them are centralized and centralized uh, energy production is very efficient you won't get any more uh, efficiency if you de decentralize it but if you decentralize it you get more reliability so a solar panel on every roof is much more efficient than um, um, solar panels in one spot um, not more efficient much, much more reliable i'm sorry um, yeah so um, thanks for listening if you made it uh, until this point and maybe we'll see you in the next video bye